والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم Welcome to a new episode of Islam 101, and I'm your host, Abu Usama al Dahabi. Today's topic of discussion will be centered around al Nikah fil Islam, marriage and the religion of al Islam. We're going to touch upon, inshallah, the virtues and the importance of marriage, as well as how does a person go about getting married and the conditions that have to be fulfilled or have to be present in order for a person's marriage to be considered the authentic and correct marriage. And inshallah, we will also get into the issue of how does a person go about getting out of his marriage, whether it is the man who wants to initiate the process or whether it is the woman, the sister, the Muslim lady who wants to initiate the process of the divorce. Concerning the marriage, there are a number of virtues that can be mentioned. We'll start with the fact that when we read about the religion of Al-Islam, we find that all of the prophets and all of the messengers were people who got married. They had wives. This is clear from the Quran that Allah has beautified to mankind, to men. And men, it includes the good men and the bad men, the religious men and the irreligious men. It includes the prophets and other than that. It has been made beautified to men in their eyes, the love of women and sons. So it is natural for a man to want to have the companionship of a woman. And that companionship has to be one which is legislated and is halal or permissible. So from the virtues of marriage is that the best of mankind, all of them, the prophets and the messengers, they used to get married. And as Muslims, we believe that Allah the Most High, He took Jesus Christ and He raised Him unto Himself. And we spoke in a previous episode about the life of the Barzakh, the life of the Barzakh, and how the Barzakh is that living that people have right now, like the prophets are living in their graves and they're praying in their graves. But Allah knows the reality of their prayer and the reality of that life. Because they are living, it does not mean, nor does it suggest, that a Muslim can go to the grave of a prophet and make supplication to that prophet or go to the grave of a saint. And Allah knows best as to the reality of who's a saint and who wasn't a saint. So the life of the Barzakh is something that only Allah knows the reality of it. Jesus Christ, Isa ibn Maryam, right now is living in the life of a Barzakhia because Allah has raised him up to himself and he's going to come back down and when he comes down, he's going to judge by the religion of Al-Islam. He's going to judge by the Quran and the authentic sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he comes back, he's going to do away with the swine. When he comes back, he's going to break the cross, which is a symbol of shirk or polytheism. And he never called to it. And he was never upon that religion of saying anything about the cross being a symbol of his religion. Not only that, but it is mentioned in the Bible, and I don't necessarily believe this or disbelieve it, but it is mentioned in the Bible that it is said, whoever is crucified on the cross, then he is cursed. So I don't know how is it conceivable that God Almighty would allow his son to be crucified on the cross. Moving past that, the point that we want to make is when Jesus Christ comes back, inshallah, he is going to get married as his other brothers did from the prophets and the messengers. So, in Al-Islam, every Muslim man and every Muslim woman should grow up with the idea and the intent of one day getting married because the prophet told us in yet another authentic hadith, whoever has gotten married, he has been successful in completing half of his religion. So let him fear Allah in the other half. When a person is married, he opens up the door and he empowers himself 
to get a number of rewards that the person who is not married, he doesn't have the opportunity to get. The couple who's married, whenever they are affectionate towards each other, whether it's the small form of affection or other than that, whenever they carry on physical relationships, in al-Islam that is looked at as being a ma'roof. This is looked at as being something that they're doing that is acceptable in the religion, and as such they will get rewarded for that. The mother, when she cooks, this is sadaqah that she's giving to her children. This is a type of charity because she's bringing good to other people. And in our religion, the Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, concerning a man who spent a lot of time in the masjid, in the mosque, he was praying, he was praying, and the other people were bringing him food, and the other people were taking care of him. The Prophet asked, who, who, who is it? Who is that man who's doing that? They said, oh, he's such a, rel a religious man, Ya Rasulullah, he's such a righteous man. He said, those people who are taking care of him are better than him. The best of you is the one who brings more benefit to others. That's the concept that's correct in al -Islam. So in this particular issue, the married man, the married woman, they're bringing benefit to their children. They're bringing benefit whenever the father goes out and he brings home the money that provides for the family, he provides shelter, he provides the food, provides the warmth and the clothes. All of those issues are considered to be a sadaqah or a charity that the father is giving to the members of his family. The unmarried man, it is not like that. We know of uh, certain scholars in the religion of Al-Islam, certain scholars who they never married. At the top of the list, those who come to mind, Shaykh Al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, as well as Al-Imam Al-Nawawi, two tremendous scholars in Al-Islam. Al-Imam Al-Suyuti never got married. So if a Muslim is aware and he has acquainted himself with the history of these three tremendous imams, these scholars in the religion, he may say, I want to cut myself off from the world and I don't want to get married because Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah didn't get married and I want to be like him. We say, no, this is not from the religion of al-Islam. It's not from the religion of al-Islam for you to take them as your examples. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that I am the one who has the most God consciousness of you people. And I fear Allah the most. And I know Allah more and better than everyone else. And yet, I get married to women. I marry women. And I pray and I go to sleep at night. I don't pray all night long. As well as, I fast and I break my fast. So whoever forsakes my sunnah he is not from me. Whoever goes out intentionally to say, I'm not going to do this particular sunnah, thinking that it's okay for him to follow Al-Imam al nawawi or Al-Imam Al-Suyuti, and he gets close to Allah by not getting married, this is a deviation. A deviation that Allah mentioned in the Quran about the people who came before us. When they're monks, as he said, they introduced and they created a deviation that Allah did not send down any authority for them to do so. So that's not the religion. The religion is the sunnah, the practices of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and not the practices of any Tom, Dick, or Harry from the people. It is the Rasul of Al-Islam. Another thing concerning this faulty concept and understanding that someone may have who wants to forsake getting married and he wants to follow one of those three imams. We say, do you know the reason why those imams didn't get married? Even though I don't agree that one of us should say we're going to follow him and not get married, but if you knew anything about the lives and the lifestyles of those three imams, then you would understand properly what prevented them from getting married. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah was in prison for a large portion of his adult life. In addition to that, he was busy either in the battlefield or riding throughout the Islamic empire soliciting funds in order to help the Muslims and to protect the Muslims, to pay for weapons, to prevent the onslaught of the Tatars. Those imams were busy with knowledge, teaching, and traveling throughout the earth. Uh, so the person who says, I don't want to get married, and he's just a lazy individual at home, and he just wants to pray sometimes, and he says he doesn't want to get married, that's not from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In addition to the virtues of marriage, it is one of the best ways that an individual could come to protect his lineage, to protect the nasl and his nasab, who he's connected to. We mentioned that al-Islam came to protect five essential things, the dururiyatul khamsa. From them, al-Islam came to protect the religion of every individual, came to protect the blood 
of every individual came to protect the money of every individual came to protect the intellect of every individual and it also came to protect the actual lineage so the lineage is established in the religion of al islam through the nikah so it's one of the best ways allah ta'ala has described for us what is the role of the muslim girl and the muslim man when they come together and he said you men are a covering for those women and those women are a covering for you. You are a clothing for them, and those women are a clothing for you. This ayah should be understood to, under, to mean, number one, marriage helps an individual to lower his gaze. He has someone who he can do with them what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made permissible in terms of getting rid of the desires from how we've been created is we've been created weak. The human being, he has what is known in Islam, in Arabic, as the shahwa, the desires. And so therefore, a man needs a woman, and a woman needs a man. And from that union comes children. Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't have a shahwa. He doesn't have any desires. And he is al-ghani. He is not in need of anyone or anything. So therefore, to say that Allah has a wife or Allah has a son is not acceptable. It's not acceptable. As it relates to the man being the clothing for the woman and the woman being the clothing for the man, everything that clothes do for an individual, the husband does for the wife and the wife does for the husband. The clothes, they beautify you. So when a person is married, he has become a complete and a beautiful human being. The Prophet said, whoever from amongst you has gotten married, he has completed half of his religion, so let him fear Allah on the other half. So marriage opens up the door for him to complete half of his religion. The one who is not married, he's not a complete individual. In addition to that, brothers and sisters, the marriage as it relates to the clothing that has been mentioned in this ayat of the Quran, this verse of the Quran, clothes, they warm the individual. They give warmth to the body. So when the person has the ability and the opportunity to have a mate, especially a mate who they find mutual love, and respect and reverence for then this is one of the best types of warmth that a person can receive in this particular life that we live so they are a clothing for us and we are also a clothing for them as well so marriage is from the sunnah of all of the prophets and all of the messengers and it is one of those ibadat in al-islam or one of those forms of worship in al-islam that should not be neglected it should not be minimized the Prophet came out to his companions one day, may the peace and blessings of Allah forever be upon him and upon his family members. And he told his family members, oh young men, whoever from amongst you has the ability to get married, then let him do so. And whoever doesn't have the ability, then let him fast. We'll come back with the conclusion of this particular segment, inshallah, after our small break. Hope to see you back, inshallah. May Allah make it easy for us. Islam 101 Islam 101. Welcome back to part two of today's episode where we're talking about al nikah al Islam, marriage in the religion of al Islam. We've already mentioned some of the virtues of marriage and we left off before the break by discussing what the Prophet said to the young people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He came out and he told the young men and the young women, Oh, you young men, you young people. Whoever has the ability to get married, then let him do so. Let him hurry up and do so. And whoever doesn't have the ability, then let him fast. The meaning of having the ability to get married in this particular narration of this hadith, it means whoever has the physical ability to get married because his wife is going to have rights and he's going to have white rights on his wife. That you are able to satisfy the physical needs that she has as part of the ability. 
And also part of the ability is the ability to financially marry, financially manage a household, to be able to take care of your wife, where you have the ability to feed her, to provide for her, to give her shelter, and to give her clothing. And whoever doesn't have the ability to do so, then let him fast. He explained the wisdom behind fasting in some other narrations of this particular hadith. He said that the fasting will cause you to be able to lower your gaze. It is a shield when you fast. It causes the desires to get broken, to break them down. The Muslim is not an individual who goes through his life and he looks at whatever he wants to look at or he says whatever he wants to say. He has to have control over his body because as we mentioned concerning the amana, the trust, your eyes are trust and therefore you have to render the trust back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way and in the correct way that the religion has informed us. As it relates to marriage very quickly inshallah just so that we can shed light on this important affair because there are different types of Muslims who are practicing marriages that are not permissible and a person may get married the wrong way and he thinks that he's actually married but in fact he's committing fornication or he's committing adultery and if a child comes out of that wedlock out of that bond then that child is really considered in al-islam to be a child that is illegitimate because we went about getting married the wrong way we got married what is called the muta marriage temporary marriage it's not permissible we got married in some places they call it the marriage and urfi where it's in secret so we want to explain what is the correct marriage in al-islam the correct marriage in al-islam the ceremony itself and when we say the ceremony we're not talking about the actual wearing of the dress or the wearing of a particular type of clothing we're talking about when the marriage is going to be performed it is something that has to have five things present five things have to be present if one of these five things are not present, then that marriage is bartened. It is rendered null and void because one of these five things are not present. Number one, from the conditions of marriage, is that you have to have the consent of the girl. No father can force his daughter. No man can force a woman to get married against her desire and against her will. So we have to know that the girl wants to marry this man. And as we mentioned, if she remains silent as a result of her shyness and her bashfulness, then that is considered to be her consent. Number two, and this is extremely important for you younger brothers, especially back in America and the United Kingdom. The second thing is that the sister has to have a wali. And the wali is her guardian. And the guardian is a man who is preferably a member of her family, like her father, her brother, her uncle, her grandfather, her son someone who is going to safeguard and protect her rights before the marriage, during the marriage, and in the unlikely event, inshallah, of a divorce even after the marriage. And the reason why I said that the brothers from America and the UK and those European countries in particular, why this is important to us is because many times we come into the religion of Islam and our families are not Muslims along with us. So therefore, if a sister is a revert to the religion of Al-Islam, she has to realize that she has to get a wali, a guardian, someone who is responsible for. And that wali has to be a Muslim. If you are a revert and you don't find that you have any relatives who are also Muslims, then what you have to do is follow the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said, the Islamic authority, the authority is the guardian for the woman who doesn't have a guardian. And that is because an Islam has not allowed the non-Muslim to be over and in charge of the affairs of the Muslim. Al-Islam is uppermost and nothing should be put over or atop of Al-Islam. And we mentioned concerning the etiquettes of the Quran even. If you have the Quran, it's not from the good etiquettes of Al-Islam because of this hadith. Al-Islam yala wa la yu'la alayhi. Al-Islam is uppermost and nothing should be put over it from the etiquettes, it's not to put another book on top of the Qur'an. But we don't say that it's haram, anything like that. So we'll continue concerning the issue of the wali. The wali is the guardian, and it is his job, and it's his responsibility to look at that particular person who's interested 
and marrying his ward. That's the second condition. The third condition that has to be present is the man who wants to marry the girl, he has to pay her a dowry. And this is only in the religion of Al-Islam. He has to pay her something that has a monetary value attached to it, inshallah. And it can be anything. It can be what he wants to give if the girl accepts it, or it can be what the girl requests or what her wali requests. But we like to tell every Muslim father, every Muslim uncle who's responsible for the girl, your daughter and marrying her off, the goal and the objective behind marrying her off is to preserve her ifa, her honor, and to protect her in her religion. She is not something that you're trying to sell, so you're going to make a dowry that is of astronomical proportions. We want you to pay 20,000 pounds, $20,000 in order to marry our daughter? No. So the religion of Islam tells the man that in order to marry this particular woman, you have to give her something that has some monetary value attached to it. The girl can forego the dowry if she wants, but the offer has to be made. Finally, the last two conditions that have to be present concerning the correct marriage in Al-Islam. And if this is not present, then there's going to be a problem. That marriage is not authentic. It's not acceptable. And that is that there has to be two fair and just Muslims. Two fair and just Muslims who come and they are the witnesses in that marriage and over that marriage. So you're going to have these two people so that if there are any discrepancies later on, those people can be referred to and they can say, yes, I was present at the marriage of so-and-so and sister so-and-so, and therefore he is entitled to receive her inheritance. Or, yes, he did marry this girl, so therefore whatever other rule or whatever other ruling comes from the religion of Islam, it could be established. So those are the five conditions for the correct marriage in Islam. We're going to stop right here to open up the door of discussion to answer any of the questions of the students here who are present with us. So if you brothers have any questions, inshallah, we'll start on this side today. Akhi Ahmed, do I have something? Yeah, you, you have mentioned some of the wrong traditions that, go, that pertain to marriage like large dowries, but some parents put obstacles in front of the guys who need to get married. For example, they refuse uh, for their daughter to be married in a rented house or they refuse young marriage. So what do you think about that? If the mother and the father or those people are responsible for either the girl or the boy, if they really see that there are certain issues that the girl has that would prevent her from marrying and being successful in the marriage or that the boy has that will be a problem if they were to get married, then by all means, they have to speak up. They have to do something about that. But usually we find that a lot of times the culture is the main culprit as it relates to delaying the marriages between the young people in our community. This is not permissible. Marriage is not something that we should delay once we find two people who are compatible and they both have the religion. The Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if someone comes to you and you see that they want to get married to someone who you're responsible for, if you're pleased with their religion and with their akhlaq, their religion and their character, the way they are, then marry them. Because if you don't, there's going to be problems in the earth. There's going to be corruption in the earth. So those parents, they only help to create that scenario of corruption in the earth. So it shouldn't be done. Yes, if you have something. Of course I have. Uh, I want to know uh, from uh, your point of view, uh, upon uh, what uh, conditions can I uh, choose my wife, uh, a Muslim wife, uh, to support me in, uh, to gain uh, the first life and last life? Concerning the type of woman that a man should look for, what are those conditions, what are those characteristics? And also when we mention about the man and what he should look for, this also holds true for the girl. Because people, as the Prophet said, men marry women for four reasons. They marry women because of their high lineage, they marry them because of their beauty, they marry them because of the money that they have, and they marry them because of their religion. He said, marry the one who has the religion and you'll be successful. In another authentic hadith, he said that this world in which we're living in, this world, this dunya, it is just a bunch of provisions. You own your car, you own your clothes, you own your house, you own your furniture, it's a bunch of provisions. And the best provision to have in this life is a righteous wife. 
If you marry a righteous wife, whether you're a PhD holder, whether you have a master's degree, whether you don't have a degree at all, if you have a good woman, she's going to always be there supporting you in the religion. So the most important aspect that we're looking for in terms of the characteristics for a wife or husband should be the religious individual, man or woman. Also, the man who's looking for a wife, he should also look for the woman who is loving and prolific, meaning she can have babies. And the way that he knows that she can have babies is by looking at his, her mother, looking at her sisters, looking at her aunts. If you saw that they had seven children, eight children, ten children, then more than likely, and Allah knows best, that girl is also one who has inherited the ability to have children. Prophet Muhammad told us, marry the loving women and the prolific women, the women who have babies, they can give babies. Don't marry the barren lady if you can help it. Marry the loving woman and the prolific woman. For verily I want to come on the last day with the majority of the followers. So this hadith helps us to understand, number one, the type of girl we should look for, and number two, a person should not be afraid and shy of having children. That's from the sunnah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has encouraged. Which doesn't mean that a person can be reckless and irresponsible. But that is what the hadith is saying. So we're going to stop here. Inshallah, we wish we could have gotten to the other students and their questions. But that's all that time allows for us in this particular segment. We're looking forward, inshallah, to seeing you at the upcoming episodes of Islam 101. Take care and be safe. Islam. والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم إسلام last episode, we dealt with the issue of a nikah in al-Islam, or marriage in al-Islam. And we had a number of comments that were made by some of the viewers who have been following our program, that they wanted this program to continue in terms of the discussion. So we're going to add another program for you, the respected audience, hopefully, to get more benefit concerning this most important topic. Because, as we mentioned, if a person doesn't get married the correct way. As a result of that, there are some evil and negative ramifications. It may be that his children who come out of result, as a result of that marriage, they may be considered to be illegitimate children. And they may be considered even to be a person who is committing zina, adultery, or fornication. So we want to recap very quickly the five conditions of the marriage. And then we're going to go to our students who have quite a few questions that are new questions and questions that were correct, uh, connected to the last program, the last episode. In order for the marriage to be considered a correct marriage in Al-Islam, it requires that we have to have the consent of the girl. She has to say, okay, I want to marry this individual, and she can't be compelled to marry someone that she doesn't want to marry. Number two, we have to have the guardian, a Muslim male, relative of the girl preferably, or any Muslim man, who has authority, for an example, the local masjid, that individual has to be responsible for the girl throughout the process of marriage, prior to her getting married, during the time that she's married. If there are any problems, they refer back to him, and he helps to make peace, to make islah, to
to bring the affairs back together. Number three, the man who wants to marry the girl, he has to give her a dowry, a token of his appreciation to say to her, I appreciate the fact that you have agreed to marry me. The wali, the guardian of the girl, has to fear Allah as it relates to this issue and not make it difficult by making an exorbitant dowry on the shoulders of the boy. And stay away from all of the other issues that will unnecessarily delay the marriage. We want our youth, we want our youngsters to hurry up and get married. There's too many trials and tribulations to the right of them, to the left of them, on TV, mass media, advertisement, everywhere they're looking, there's the problem of their desires, their desires. In the societies that we're living in, it's very easy for a girl or boy to fall into what would be displeasing to Allah and what would be a disgrace to her mother and her father. So don't help the devil against your children. Finally, the last two conditions that have to be present is that there has to be two male witnesses. Two male witnesses. In the absence of two male witnesses, you can have four witnesses from amongst the women. Four women who are witnessing that issue or one male and two women. This is the correct five conditions that have to be present concerning the dowry in Al-Islam, concerning the marriage in Al-Islam. So we're going to open up the floor, inshallah, in the discussion, answer the questions of all of the brothers. We're going to start with my brother Sardar, inshallah. Sardar, go ahead. Okay, my question is that in Islam, men can have several wives, but women cannot have a several man, husband, I mean. Uh, so some people say that it's unfair. What you can say to them? Concerning the age-old argument, if men can have more than one wife, why shouldn't it be that women can have more than one husband? We say that this is a classic case of mixing apples and oranges and judging in an affair that is totally different. One of the main reasons why men have more than one wife in El Islam. A man can have more than one wife is because there are more women than there are men. You gather together all of the women in the world, all of the men in the world, and you married each and every man to one woman. There are going to be a number of women who are left out in the cold. So what do they do? El Islam allowed us to take more than one wife. And in the issue of taking more, one, more than one wife, it is an issue with a system. It is not something that's done haphazardly, without any responsibility. Now is not the time to get into that. But taking another wife is not something that is necessarily easy, and it's not for every single individual. Another case, as it relates to a man having multiple wives, and why a woman doesn't have the ability to have more than one husband, is because when... The woman conceives and she becomes pregnant. Who does the child belong to? Someone will say, well, we could just do a DNA test. Well, that wouldn't be realistic because some people have the ability to do DNA tests. Some people in the West, but the vast majority of people in this world, they don't have the resources that will allow them to do a DNA test, especially in the places where the Muslims come from right now. They wouldn't be able to do DNA tests so as we mentioned so many times before, Al-Islam came to protect five things, and one of the things that it came to protect is the lineage. So the Prophet of Al-Islam himself, he told the Muslim men, do not allow, do not allow one man's semen to enter upon another man's semen, which is a very important hadith. It's a very important aspect of our religion. A sister, a lady, she embraces the religion of Al-Islam. And there's a brother who sees her and he wants to marry her because he's impressed with her religion. Impressed with her and he wants to marry her. We say, you have to look at this hadith of Rasulullah that I just mentioned and you have to wait. And you have to wait until that particular girl has one monthly cycle so that we can be absolutely sure she is not carrying the baby of another man. Whether it was her husband in the times when she wasn't a Muslim or whether it was a person who was not her husband. So in Al-Islam, before a man can marry another woman, if it is known that she's not a virgin girl, then it's not permissible to allow one man to enter his fluid upon another woman. So if it was allowed for her to have more than one husband, there can be discrepancies as it relates to who the actual father is of the baby that's in her womb. 
So those are some of the issues. But we say again, the women have to be satisfied with being women and men have to be satisfied with being men. We have our own unique responsibilities and our own unique creation. And we have to be satisfied with what Allah has legislated for both sexes. Okay, Akhi Ahmed. Um, I actually have a question about engagement. And during engagement, find a lot of Muslims in, in Muslim community fall fall into impermissible acts. So if you can shed the light on some of the issues that pertain to engagement. Concerning the issue of engagements, and we use that word very loosely, engagements. We shouldn't view engagement in the way that the typical Western outlook and understanding of engagement is. Yes, there's nothing wrong with having a process by which both families come to know each other. The girl and the boy, they come to know each other. And then they may decide, okay, we're going to get married, but we want to wait until we finish our education. Or we want to wait until the boy can save up another, enough money to do A, B, or C. This is permissible in the religion, but it's only permissible when we can keep and maintain the limits that have been ordained by Allah. There's no dating. It's not permissible, even though they're going to get married and they are engaged. Doesn't mean that they can go to the movies alone. Doesn't even mean that they can sit in his house or her house alone. There always has to be a third party who is an adult and they can supervise what's going on. So this concept of the engagement, it shouldn't be viewed in the typical Western concept. And we have to be careful because of these long, drawn-out engagements many times only opens up the door for some problems. The boy starts to be, find it very difficult to control himself, and the girl finds it difficult to control herself. And the natural process takes over because a shaitan, the devil, Satan, is inside of the mix, inside of the issue. And then before you know it, something takes place that will dishonor everyone who's involved in that particular process of getting married. So the engagement is okay, but don't look at it from the Western outlook and viewpoint. We have to have some give and take in the issue, especially as it relates to those people who are reverts to the religion. The revert comes into the religion and he doesn't have a history of a family where the girl's family or the boy's family can look to see what kind of cloth was he cut from or was she cut from. So therefore, it may require a little longer so that the people will come to know who this individual is and where do they come from? So that requires some serious consideration and contemplation for the one who wants to marry the revert. Again, the bottom line is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If someone comes to you and you are impressed and you are pleased with his religion and with his character, the way he is, then marry him. If you don't marry him, then there's going to be corruption in the earth. And we should try to facilitate ease for all of the people involved. Akhi Yasir. I have a comment uh, on the case which uh, my brother Sardor uh, talked about. Uh, uh, in, the, in this case, uh, I think uh, not just uh, Muslims who refuse uh, that, uh, that case. Um, as a Muslim, I can't uh, imagine my wife in a relation with another man. And um, also, uh, my brother Nick, can you imagine your wife uh, in a relationship with another man? I have no wife, actually, but it will be a desirable <laughs> situation. <laughs> Uh, I, will, I wish I will never be in that kind of situation where my wife is, is with another man. Uh, no one can imagine it. Also, we, and I know this is not your question. You heard it. Who said or uh, who asked this question can't imagine his, his wife in this case, not just the Muslims. Okay. You have a question? You want to ask a question no, as well? Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, uh, Nick. I've got some. Uh, my first question is... I know that Muslims are allowed s several wives, and imagine that ca such a situation. Uh, a man already has, say, three wives, and he wants to marry a fourth. But the new wife is younger and is stronger and is more beautiful. And it can cause kind of jealousy and bad treatment from the side of previous wives. What, is ca what kind of regulations are in Islam to prevent such situation? Uh, concerning this issue of the plural marriage, I think that there needs to be an episode that will be dedicated to the fiqh and the understanding and how to practice plural marriage correctly. Because as I mentioned, plural marriage is 
a misunderstood aspect of our religion, even by Muslims, even by Muslims. And it's not practiced all the time in the correct way. The best way and the best practice of the plural marriage is what we had with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even with him, there were some jealousies that transpired between some of his wives. But I think the main ingredient as it relates in this, to this issue and the overriding factor is the concept of a taqwa, the concept of being conscious of Allah and fearing Allah. The husband and all of the women involved and even that extends to all of the family members connected to all of them. All of the friends connected to all of them. We have to have a level of taqwa. With God consciousness and with taqwa, people will avoid, uh, avoid oppressing each other and avoid falling into that which is not permissible. So we're going to stop right here, inshallah, and we'll come back to this issue after the break. We hope that you'll tune in. May Allah make it easy for all of us. Islam. 101 Many people trying to get together but all their efforts were in vain because of ignoring or turning away from this great foundation. We see many people coming to the way of truth, following the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but later on they get off track. What is the reason behind that? Unity is a result it's not a cover-up. We have to be united from inside. And Allah made this clear in the Quran when He said, Welcome back to the second chapter of Islam 101 and we're dealing with the issue of marriage in Al-Islam. We were speaking about a number of issues and we left off with the last point concerning everyone fearing Allah as it relates to the plural marriage issue, the husband who has multiple wives. He has to fear Allah, his wives have to be people who fear Allah and all of their relatives also have to be conscious and diligent in trying to fear Allah. And this is going to minimize the problems and not allow the problems to get out of hand, which will ultimately lead to people being unhappy, which will also lead to divorces. And then we have all of the other social issues that come as a result of that. Children who are growing up in fatherless homes. So every man he has to fear Allah. Ali ibn Abi Talib, radhi Allah anhu, may Allah be pleased with him, he gave advice to the men who are the wali or the guardians, the awliya of these women. If you are a guardian of a woman, he said, marry your ward, your daughter, your sister. Marry her off to a man who has a taqwa, to a man who has God consciousness. Because this individual, if it turns out that he loves your daughter, he loves her, he's going to always honor her, live with her and be married to her in honor. And if he doesn't love her because they're not compatible or something happens, he doesn't love her, he's not going to oppress her. So with this taqwa, with this God consciousness, if this man were to get another wife, a second wife, a third wife, he would always try his best to make jihad against his desires to practice the religion and to do what is correct and to be fair and just. So plural marriage is not easy and it's not for everyone. You have to have enough money and that's not the important, most important issue. It has to have enough time. And he has to have the disposition and the mentality to be able to manage such a situation. And in addition to that, he has to have a group of women who have harmony between themselves. He cannot be married to one woman who is like fire in her personality. Then he's going to bring into the equation a woman who's like gasoline or petrol. It doesn't work and it doesn't make sense. So it's not about your desires. Marriage is about helping to build and to further the cause of the Islamic community. We want to shift gears now. We want to leave the issue of marriage altogether as it relates to our explanation. Maybe another question will come about marriage. We'll deal with that. And we want to go into the next topic that's connected to marriage, and that is the divorce, a talaq. Getting divorced in Al-Islam. Many people misunderstand this point as well from the Muslims. They think that when you want to divorce a lady, please pay attention to this issue, Muslim or non-Muslim. It is not correct. When a man wants to divorce his wife, that he says to his wife, you're divorced, 
you're a divorce, you're a divorce. That is not the correct understanding. Nor is it correct for him to say, you're divorced, and then he waits a month, and then he says, you're divorced, and then he waits the third month, and then he, he says, you're divorced. This is not the correct way of divorcing the woman. The correct way of divorcing the woman in El Islam is, if a man wants to divorce his wife, he has to wait, and he has to look. Today I want to divorce my wife. This man is saying, I'm speaking on behalf of this man, because as it relates to divorce, brothers, Rasulullah said, don't play around with the issue of divorce. When you play with it, it's viewed as being serious. You can't say, you're divorced, and then come and say, I was just playing. If you say you're divorced, even if you were playing, it counts. So the correct way that a man divorces his wife, he says, I want to divorce my wife, so now I have to look. Have I had any physical relationships with her since her last mints? If I did, then I can't divorce her. I have to be patient. I have to wait until her new mints comes. And if I still want to divorce her, and I'm adamant about divorcing her, once she becomes clean, I say, you're divorced. That's the first divorce in El Islam. That's the correct way. And look at the wisdom behind this. If a man has had relationships with his wife and now he has to wait for two weeks, three weeks, and he waits for the men, says, what do you think is going to happen? He's going to start desiring his wife again. His anger is going to subside. They're going to come to their senses and they're going to make up. So that's one of the practical ways in which the legislation of Al-Islam has reduced the divorce rate. So that's the first thing. He has to look. Have I had relationships with her? If he didn't have relationships with her, since her last mince, he can say, you're divorced. Now she waits for three minces, not three months, for three minces. And she remains in his home. She shouldn't leave his home, nor should he leave the home. If three cycles come and go, then that woman is divorced from that man, and she can leave the house, and she's free to marry someone else. While he's waiting for those three cycles to come, the three minces to come, if he says to his wife, I want to take you back, and they agree to come back. Or if they have physical relationships, if they have sexual relationships, then that is the first divorce that has been broken. They live together for five more years. Something happens. He becomes upset. He wants to divorce her. He follows the same process. He says, did she have a cycle yet? If she didn't have her cycle, he can say you're divorced. Now she's waiting for three cycles again. If he brings her back by saying it, or he has relationships with her, then that's the second divorce. They come together. Three cycles is very important that it's not three months. So now he's on two divorces. He divorced her the first time that I explained to you. He did the same thing the second time. You have to look. Did she have a cycle? If she had a cycle, you have to wait until a new cycle comes. If you are adamant about divorcing her, you can divorce her. If she didn't have a cycle, then you can divorce her right then and she can wait and she has to wait for the three monthly cycles. After that, six years go by and something else happens. He has to wait and he has to see, did she have a cycle or not? If she didn't have a cycle and he says, your divorce, that is the third divorce. At that time, she doesn't have to wait for any cycle as it relates to her husband. She just goes and she's out of his house, and it's not permissible for them to be together now, because in this case, she's like any other woman to him, and he's like any other man, and he can never remarry her again until she married another man, and that man consummated the marriage. As it relates to the woman who is pregnant, if she is divorced during her pregnancy, then the period that that is something that is permissible. Obviously, she's not going to have a cycle because she's pregnant. So if he says to the pregnant woman, you are divorced, then what happens is she, instead of waiting for the cycle to come, she waits for her baby to drop. If her baby falls back without him saying, you're my wife again, or without him having relationships with her again, then that is the completion of that particular marriage. She can go off and she can marry someone else. So I'm going to stop here because I hope that's clear. If not, maybe it'll come through the questions of the students. So if you guys have any questions concerning the process of a divorce, the danger of divorce, or whatever you can ask here. Before you do the, so, there's a famous hadith that you may have heard of. Out of all of the things that are halal, all of the things that are permissible, the most hated thing by Allah that's permissible is divorce. 
This is not an authentic hadith. It's not authentic. And we explained in the halal and the haram of Al-Islam that the haram are those things that are harmful or dirty. And the halal are those things, the permissible things, are those things that are beneficial and they're pure. Those things that will bring you some benefit. So how is Allah, the Most High, going to allow something and it is something that He hates? He only allows to be permissible those things that He loves and those things that He likes. But it shouldn't be misused and it shouldn't be abused, the divorce. The man should think 1,000 times, 2,000 times before destroying the bond of his family. Okay, Ahmed, do you have a question? I have a question actually it pertains Muslims who speak Arabic. You find a lot of guys who are married and they swear by divorce. And they swear a lot by divorce. So what, what is the ruling of that? Concerning this issue of some of the Muslim people who speak Arabic, They'll say to their wife, or they'll even say to some, any, any regular person, they'll say to the taxi driver, if you don't take me here, wallahi, I'll divorce my wife. I swear that I'll divorce my wife. It's a condition. If you don't do it, I'll divorce my wife. Or he may say to his wife, for an example, if you don't do this, I'm going to divorce you, but this is talking about the swear. You have to do it, or I'll divorce my wife. What is that? Does that actually count? Does that actually work? There is a lot of speech from the scholars of Al-Islam concerning this. All I want to mention here concerning this point is that it shouldn't be done. I don't want to open the door of this discussion right now because I think it's a topic that needs to be discussed from top to bottom. Does it happen? Does it not happen? If it's the taxi driver doesn't take him, does he have to divorce his wife? I don't want to open that discussion right here. All I say is people should avoid using that type of swearing. To swear, you should just say, Wallahi, or swear by one of the characteristics of Allah and not swear by the divorce. Yes, sir. Uh, do I have uh, some responsibilities towards my wife after divorcing, according to Islam regulations? If a man divorces his wife, does he have any responsibility towards her after the divorce? Of course he has responsibilities towards her, especially if she has children. And the first responsibility is what Allah told us in the Quran, the men who divorces their wives. Don't forget the virtues that existed between you people. You were together. You have children. She gave you things that no one else gave you in the life. How can you now turn around and become a criminal? And how can she turn around and become a criminal? And you start dealing with each other as in an uncivilized manner. So the first right is that you guys, everyone, they have to remember the rights. They have to remember the virtues that both parties have, both parties have over the other party. Also, in addition to that, if she has children, he's responsible for maintaining those children, for providing for and maintaining all of his children. From what is not her right is what we find in the Western societies, that she is entitled to alimony. She gets half of his property. This is not Islamic. She doesn't have a right to half of his property. She has a right to what Allah has ordained for her. And that is that he takes care of his children. And that may include their second or their docile, where they're going to live, their shelter. He has to take care of their education, has to take care of their, their what they need to eat and so forth and so on. That's his responsibility if he doesn't have custody of those children. And then if and when he gets custody of the children, he is not responsible. As long as he has children connected to that woman, he has to take care of those children. But if he doesn't have any children connected to her, then she's a regular Muslim. He makes dua, supplication for her, and that's it. He doesn't have any responsibility to that particular woman. He divorces a woman, and he continues to pay for the next 25, 30 years money as alimony to her. This is not permissible. It's not permissible and it's not from our religion. So we want to tell our sisters, especially in the West, be careful about using the laws of the non-Muslims, the disbelievers, in order to oppress the Muslims. Like going to the court of law in the secular countries like the U.S. and the U.K. And you bring the man up on charges and they give you half of his earnings. This is not permissible. This is stealing in religion of Al-Islam. This is sariqa, stealing, and it's not permissible. Uh, I don't think we have any more time. I'm sorry, guys. Inshallah, I'll be sure to let you guys get the first question in the next episode. Bidhanillah. We're going to bring this topic about marriage and divorce to a close. Hot topic. 
And it's a topic that really needs more discussion, to be honest with you. Hopefully, we may make some topics about what Ahmed mentioned and other than that. But until then, tune in for the next episode of Islam 101. A very it's a pleasure having you with us. Islam.